afternoon. Uh, my name is Felipe Ador. I'm a professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, where I, uh, I work at the Interdisciplinary Center for Social Development. Uh, I'm talking here from Rio de Janeiro, so for me here is good morning. Uh, I first would like to, to thank the invitation from our center, from Jose Moutinho, uh, to moderate this, this panel. Uh, today we'll have the presentation of our, uh, our friend D.K., D.K. Osho Asher. He's an assistant professor of architecture, engineering, design at the Stukman School, College and of Arts and Architecture on, architecture on Penn State University. Uh, D.K. will We'll talk about wild innovation, bottom-up bottom tactics for inclusive blue-green economies. And I'm happy to be here. I think just to make some introduction, uh, we are on a very uh, different uh, context. And I think this pandemic context is showing us that we have to rethink our development model in, uh, in order to guarantee the well-being of the majority of our population. Uh, we have to rethink our economic model and also our, our technological model. So uh, I'm, I, I, we work here on this technological field, working on a, this field of, for technology for social development. And we, we always say that uh, we should have a, a, a strong movement, movement to, to, to build a new technological framework. And this new technological framework should, should, should first uh, promote an extension of the frame of reference used for technological decision making, uh, including the groups that are historically uh, marginalized from the, from the spaces where the, the technological development is is, is made. Uh, so we have to, to uh, try to dem democratize this process of technology development and breaking with this, uh, I would say, elitist, hierarchical perspective that is also very present on the universities and, and be able to, to have a more constructive dialogue with popular knowledge, knowledge, with empirical knowledge, uh, value, all the technology, all the engineering, and all the, the knowledge that, uh, that is produced and is present on, on communities, on traditional uh, groups. Uh, so we in Brazil have this, this movement where we try to, to think the engineering and the technology and the innovation uh, on a more popular and, and democratic perspective, trying to, to involve the workers in all the process to, to of technological development. And, uh, and I think the, the experience, the DK's experience uh, and proposal are very, very, uh, have, I have a strong dialogue with that, so I'm very happy to be here and anxious to, to see the presentation. Uh, I would ask our participants, if they have any question, uh, you should put it on the Q&A box, not on the chat, so we could manage these questions uh, after the DK presentation. Uh, so we have uh, a conference of around 30 minutes, and then after that, we will we'll open to batch questions and debate. So please, DK, feel free to start. Hello, everyone. So I guess this just magically works. So you can see me. I'm really excited to join you all today. Thank you for that introduction, um, Philip. And hello to um, all of you around the world and 
uh, it's nice to see the little check-ins, people who are chatting on in the sidebar. Um, so I'm, I'm, I just really, I think I can share. Is my screen shared? Yes. Okay, great. So um, uh, thank you for that introduction, Philip. Um, and I'm excited to be with you all today and, and try and share in some ways some initial ideas, um, uh, maybe as a, as a sort of provocation and we can hopefully have um, continued conversation around this in the, the coming days and weeks and months. And um, in particular, I think most of you know that the, with the Air Center we'll be having a, a sort of um, conversation or sort of summit um, here in, in Pennsylvania um, actually quite soon. And we hope to sort of have further conversation about maybe some of the ideas I might raise today um, as we move forward to that, that event. Um, so I just sort of showed this because I have, uh, I sort of wear a lot of different hats. Um, I'm, I'm a assistant professor at Penn State uh, and part of ISEDA, the Alliance for Education, Science, Engineering, and Design with Africa, along with Professor Greg Jenkins, who I think will join us later. Maybe you can even see him now. Um, and I run the Humanitarian Materials Lab. But I wanted to talk about wild innovation, which as far as I know is not really necessarily a thing. Um, but I wanted to try and sort of, uh, as I said, sort of throw it out there as a provocation um, based on an idea of, of uh, wild architecture put forward by a Japanese architect named Akihisa Hirata. Um, so again, I sort of put this here as a, as a starting point because I'm speaking to you all from uh, central Pennsylvania here in the United States, um, which like the rest of the world is, is sort of very much impacted by COVID-19 or in some ways, maybe not exactly just like the rest of the world, but at the same time um, also really uh, sort of is a society being confronting once again, um, sort of for the latest time, the very, very deep systemic injustices which exist within this society and which I think most people recognize at this point um, are actually sort of prevalent around the world. And I think it's important to consider the sort of moment as we talk about the sort of uh, opportunities of, of blue innovation um, and what the Atlantic Ocean can, can offer to humanity's future development. And sort of the other things I throw out here as a kind of counterpoint to this is that what are some African models of, of what I like to call blue-green infrastructure? Um, looking at very much this interface between sort of where the water meets the land and how the sort of the relationship between water and land um, governs how society can function. And what are some examples of sort of open design for social innovation um, coming out of African spaces and how can these be opened up um, or sort of amplified sort of through greater, broader participation to scale the impact of design action, which is not sort of tacitly or indirectly or inadvertently or accidentally, but directly and deliberately trying to take action um, against the systemic injustices which exist um, across, across the earth. So hopefully I can triangulate between these. Like I said, I'll talk a little bit about um, this historical context, um, introduce the idea of, of wild architecture, which if you can bear with me, I hope I can uh, extend to show how it can be relevant to a broader discourse around innovation. And I'll show a few projects, um, a couple uh, which I led the design of and um, a couple, another by another architect um, from Nigeria. So um, I think most of the people who would be on this webinar or this call right now are familiar with these kinds of images, uh, super familiar and much more sophisticated and advanced versions now, obviously. Um, but understanding what does the Atlantic Ocean mean um, in all of its complexity and, and what does that mean in terms of um, our strategic thinking about the future of, of sort of human civilization or how we live on this planet. Um, and in particular, those countries and those peoples that are living somehow directly adjacent to the Atlantic Ocean. But how often do we also talk about these other flows that we also all know um, 
occurred within the same arena. And this is the, the um, sort of uh, the flow of, of, uh, of African bodies um, of people out of Africa um, into a very variety of ports in the Americas um, that were the primary sort of ports for slavery and, and the sort of sheer numbers, um, you know, millions and millions uh, who, who made that voyage as well as many others who, who did not complete that voyage, right? Who, who lost their lives um, at sea, in the sea, both because of poor treatment, but also through deliberate acts to, to free themselves from such a sort of horrific um, existence. So again, I show this um, for a couple of reasons. One being not just to sort of, I don't know, just make everyone feel bad in a way, but to recognize that this happened. And also to recognize that there are very sort of um, uh, deep sort of human links between these ports, right? So these are the ports of departure and the ports of arrival and the sort of human network that exists across history and across time that links these, these spatial geographies um, in ways that we both recognize and, and do not. And this, is, this video takes two minutes. Many of you may have seen it already. Um, those of you who haven't, I would, I'm actually gonna just let it play and I'll probably talk at some point and just sort of let the last minute play out. But this is actually an animation and hopefully you can see also on your screens, since you're seeing my screen, these little tiny specks and these little dots which are flitting across the Atlantic. And these are actually the, the, the ships that carried the slaves um, from Africa uh, to the Americas. And you can see across the years, um, sort of the slow um, pickup at the the, the rate and the frequency of the voyages, um, and as well as over time, the actual carrying capacity of the vessels um, as certain aspects of this became more sophisticated. Um, So, you know, this is absolutely insane. And I think not just because of the fact that human beings were trafficking other human beings as sort of as commodities or as property, but also the fact that all of this is hyper-documented because the slaves that were transported were considered to be property. And so therefore, as part of the kind of economic structure and were tracked. So all of this is sort of, we have data on this, there's information about this, and yet very little effort has been done, if you really think about it, to systematically dismantle um, and to really address the, the repercussions of, of this human trafficking across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, obviously, it stops, um, and you see that sort of beginning to happen. Uh, but there's actual knowledge about this traffic. We know very much about what happened. Um, and how do we make sense of this or confront this today? Now, I show this because as people take to the streets, um, not only in the United States, but also around the world in solidarity, um, what sometimes people overlook is that it's not necessarily a problem just about police brutality or about um, you know, people not having better schools in a particular place. I mean, all of these are part of the problem. But there's also a kind of core and fundamental issue, which is that you can only sort of subjugate another person when you start to not believe that they're fully human, that somehow something about them is not equivalent to, to you yourself. Um, and these are, I mean, the, the chain gangs of, of even young boys who have to work together and they're considered to be valuable solely through their labor, right? So not because they're human beings or because they're alive or because of the potential ideas they might have, but purely as a kind of machine for doing work. And if you think about it, this is still very much how modern society works. And it's become much more sophisticated. Um, we're not necessarily all literally chained, chained together, 
but there is still this idea that you have value through your labor and through your work. And this is intertwined with an economic structure which sees people through this kind of a lens. So I say this as a preface um, in part to say, what, what do we do if we think about this? And, and how can we combat this or challenge this or dismantle this or unravel it? Um, so uh, wild architecture is, is um, sort of an idea that was put forward by, as I said, a Japanese architect by the name of Iki, Ikihisa Hirata. Um, he wrote this text uh, a couple years ago um, where he puts forward a, an idea that he calls Karamare Shiru, uh, which I guess is a, a neologism in that it's not actually a real word, but it's a word that he sort of made up using some existing words um, to suggest a meaning. And he presents this idea of, of Karamare, Karamare Shiru or wild architecture as a way of him making sense of where he sees the future of architecture going. And so apparently, again, I'm not fluent, I don't speak Japanese, but I guess karmari means something, something intertwining something else. Uh, and shiro is sort of the, the potentialness or the, the potential or the ability of something have, to have the potential to do something. So I guess these two coming together is in a way the, the potential of something to intertwine with something else. And he, he presents this idea or explains it through a series of, of, of three sort of diagrams, uh, which I will try to explain and, and um, uh, I'll, well, I'll do the best I can. So I guess the first one is he, he tells this kind of story or the anecdote of, of uh, fish eggs or fish roe and apparently how they're the, some certain fish lay these eggs in, in seaweed and the seaweed grows um, in a particular, you know, part of the seabed in a particular kind of uneven rocky terrain. And he talks about this as a kind of recursive um, or stepwise uh, sort of nesting of, 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 of housing or of, of conceptually of architecture in that the fish eggs live within the seaweed and the seaweed lives within this sort of rock on the bottom of the ocean. And in that same uh, sort of space, um, many other creatures and organisms and sea life are also kind of living. And so if you recognize that there are sort of multiple scales in which uh, things occupy space or in which beings live, it opens up this question of where really then is the location of architecture. And he posits that if we often think about, um, you know, architecture as very sort of simple boxes that are somehow bounded or contained, um, really that's a lot less valuable and a lot less uh, relevant to the way the world actually works than something which is highly variegated and something which can have really a multitude of uh, ecological niches where many different organisms can each find a place to, to uh, um, find a way to live their life and, and sort of have a quality of life in a place which is appropriate for them. And so how do you think about this sort of shift? And if you then think about architecture as a kind of uh, massively scaled or sort of vastly distributed um, web of, of different kinds of ecological niches where different types of organisms and, and creatures, not only people, can live and, and, uh, and, and sort of be successful in their life, then so again, what does that mean from a kind of ecological view of architecture? So um, I guess I say all of this again because he ultimately presents that this idea of what he calls wild architecture is, and, and I will quote two, two sentences as he presents this, is a structure with rifts between elements that are never completely fused. It is a reckless approach to architecture. It is a wild kind of hierarchical structuring, different from self-similar fractals. So, um, and he presents this as a kind of speculative idea about where the future may go where he suggests we're moving from kind of singular views or singularity to regimes of multiplicity, where sort of if in the past we thought about things like architecture or design or how we build things as somehow self-complete and autonomous as at least on a certain level derived from a sort of single author or tradition of authorship um, or sort of methods or formal concepts, he imagines that in the future, these systems will be not completely closed. They will be invaded by foreign elements. And most significantly and most important, he also says 
that in this kind of future regime, there may be an effort to deliberately integrate the heterogeneous aspirations from others. So in other words, not just saying that many different people or things will be happening, but to actually deliberately try to make, make sense or, or create a kind of loose, loose scaffolding um, that can enable many different people to sort of pursue um, their objectives and their goals. And this is a kind of move from an idea of purity to, to one of messiness. And he suggests that this sort of interference between all of these different sort of uh, viewpoints and perspectives and activities can be productive. So having said this, again, in the context of, of some of the histories that happened within the Atlantic Ocean or across the Atlantic Ocean, which we sometimes gloss over, I would also then encourage us to say that as we think about designing a future for the Atlantic, which is more positive and more inclusive, we should also begin to think, how much do we really necessarily know about the past? And I say this because if you know sort of the term or the, the etymology or the roots of this idea, or even the notion of a barbarian, right? A barbarian, which applies to essentially the history of black bodies, which are too often considered to be primitive or subhuman or somehow not uh, sort of equivalent to other types of people or traditions or what it might have you be. The actual historical roots of the idea of barbarian, at least going back to the, the Greeks, is simply somebody from somewhere else who speaks a different language and has different customs, right? So there's a kind of instinctive idea within most human societies to somehow distrust or fear otherness and to feel that if somebody speaks a different language um, or has a different system of traditions or way of doing things, that it must be inferior. And that was the attitude of the ancient Greeks. And it's been the attitude of many other traditions that somehow tried to seek lineage from the, uh, the ancient Greeks through the Roman empire. But there's always been a fear of otherness and there's been a deliberate sort of effort to somehow um, undermine or bring down um, sort of uh, worldviews or technological regimes which may threaten those of a, of a particular group. So most of you probably don't know what this is or you might be imagining. And we don't even really necessarily know if this is what it looks like, but these are the kinds of images which exist of the ancient kingdom of Benin uh, in, in what today we know as Nigeria. And the reason why we don't know what this ancient city looks like anymore is because the British burnt it to the ground uh, just before the, the beginning of the 20th century. Um, because as any good sustainable uh, sort of human settlement, it was built out of renewable materials, um, and was not sort of designed with an anticipation that somebody would come and try to burn the entire thing down. But it was made out of natural materials. And so when it was burnt to the ground, we lost the ability to walk the streets of this city, uh, which by all accounts and historical accounts was truly quite tremendous and highly organized, highly structured. Um, but I show it here not simply to say that it is one of many sort of ancient cities and, and kingdoms uh, within sort of the African context, which uh, were embodiments of highly advanced technology, uh, which were deliberately destroyed by, by other parties. It's not necessarily just to say that, but to say, can we still try to uncover the knowledge that was embedded within these cities? And, and I would offer that we can. So one thing about the, the kingdom of Benin, which is truly remarkable, is that it was not just a city, uh, as we understand it today, with houses and businesses and shops, but it was also an absolutely enormous instance of what today we call green infrastructure, which is using natural systems uh, to support um, sort of humans living together in a particular place. So actually the, the walls of, of, the, of the kingdom of, of uh, ancient Benin are the largest infrastructure ever built by humans in our history, larger than the Great Wall of China. More earth was moved. Um, in the production of these, of these walls to build this, this city um, over 160 kilometers. But the actual scale of the earth moved is truly phenomenal because they were not just walls and you can still find them, they exist um, scattered all throughout the, the forest. Um, they were not just walls, but you can sort of see here as well, they were actually canals and they were designed not only as fortifications, but also to channel water, uh, to manage storm water, um, as well as to facilitate agriculture. And here's the kind of scale of, of where these walls are um, uh, relative to, to modern day Lagos, where those of you who are familiar with uh, sort of, well, <laughs> weather today are aware of the dangers that cities like Lagos have, which are built essentially on a lagoon. The name literally means lagoon. 
and are threatened with flooding uh, frequently. How do we even know what we could learn from an ancient kingdom or an ancient city like this kingdom of Benin, which was literally built in a very similar sort of, uh, sort of geographic territory on this kind of edge condition between the Atlantic Ocean and the land and was literally designed from, from the bottom up to, to manage water at a massive scale. We don't know because we don't understand these technologies. And yet this is the kind of technology which uh, space and satellite technologies can greatly help us understand um, uh, much more rapidly. So that was my sort of very long 20 minute wind up. I guess I have about 10 minutes now left before we'll, we'll sort of go into a conversation. So very quickly, I will show you a few contemporary projects um, coming out of uh, Ghana and Nigeria and West Africa. Um, which I believe may be part of a beginning to think about how we can uh, empower sort of um, many of the people who are not necessarily as fully empowered by our technological systems today. So um, this is actually a project designed by uh, Kunle Adeyemi, um, whose firm is called Enle, uh, based in uh, the Netherlands and in Nigeria. Makoko is a, is a large, um, floating slum that you see as you pass along. Uh, this is on the right hand side. This is a bridge going into Victoria Island. Um, and so the entire slum is essentially built on stilts um, over the water. Uh, I, I know at least Greg was on this call and maybe a few others actually went to visit Makoko after the Air Center um, uh, event last year in, in Nigeria. Um, so, and here you see the highway sort of going onto Victoria Island. So this building that you see here in the front, which is a triangle is actually a school. Uh, it's floating. So unlike some of the other buildings, which are built very precariously on very slender two by fours as kind of legs that are going down into the, the, the lake bed um, uh, or filled on top of sawdust and trash that's sort of filled as infill into the body of water. This is actually floating. Um, and so you can see, you can reach it by boat um, or I should say it was, um, here you see they use sort of, they repurposed old plastic barrels, built this sort of floating deck on which they built this, uh, wooden frame. Um, and here you can see it opened, uh, the classrooms, I believe on the middle and the top is maybe sort of uh, play space and the larger, the bottom is a larger communal, uh, space as well. Um, here you can see the sort of plans. So those images I showed you were the, the first prototype, which was built, um, in Makoko, uh, it actually collapsed, uh, I believe maybe a year ago, it was a prototype. Um, and so that's a larger conversation, but I think the fact that it collapsed is really not necessarily a problem per se. As I said, it's more complicated. Apparently some people were stealing some components of the building because they felt like it was connected to sort of global community. And so therefore could replace those parts if they were stolen, but they were able to build subsequent prototypes, um, including, uh, more recently in China. These are some of the later prototypes. Um, and if you follow Kunle's work uh, with, these, um, with these floating schools, it's not considered a one-off of building one floating school for one slum in, in the city of, 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 Niger of Lagos in Nigeria, but he's actually interested in thinking about how do we think about the future of our cities that are going to flood, that are going to be dealing constantly with ever more extreme weather events um, and are, built on land, but have to engage water. And so here's a kind of prototype that he imagines to be something that we can use in the future when we have to build floating cities. And he sees this as a technology um, out of Africa that can address African issues, but which the rest of the world um, can equally participate in. So um, I will show you again, just maybe another project. So. Um, this is a, I guess, a larger scale urban project. This is Accra and Tema, uh, dual cities, uh, the capital of, of Accra, or capital in, of, of Ghana. Um, and a project that we did sort of um, just outside of that, which is really not the point so much to say is that that was a new, a new sort of development for about 150,000 people over 20 square miles. Um, but that was actually a project that was designed based off of a community a new town project that we designed in uh, Eastern Nigeria in Anambra State for a community called Anam. The image on the left is the, the Niger River um, meeting with the Anambra River at uh, um, uh, Onicha, which is one of the largest market uh, cities in, in Africa. 
And um, up on the, above that, you see these eight communities that live together um, along the banks of the Azichi River. And so we led a multi-year participatory planning process where we actually sort of mapped the site, worked with the community to understand their needs. Um, and out of that, we're able to um, sort of develop uh, a model for a community which lives on the banks of a river, which floods such that six, six months or at least four months of the year, uh, most of the, these areas are only accessible by boat. So we don't develop a master plan based on some traditional sort of Igbo understandings of landscape, um, also including sort of best practices of contemporary green infrastructure. So understanding how can we use the landscape and also the sort of traditional productive landscapes of this community um, through particular types of intercropping, um, through using soil from the site um, to produce bricks uh, through a brick factory. Here you can see where we trained the local community, um, the sort of initial brick factory that was set up and running. Um, and then the housing typologies, which, which were designed from as simple as a sort of $1,000 house for somebody who doesn't have a lot of money, all the way up to, or even houses using sort of local bamboos in a systematic way, as well as up to houses of people who have um, substantial, substantially larger amounts of money. Um, I will jump to um, bear with me. Okay. So um, I'll just jump to uh, a project which um, I typically talk a lot about, and this is called the Agaloshi Makerspace Platform. I'm really only gonna spend like two minutes on it here simply to talk about, this is a project which thinks about how can you develop a deployable makerspace which can be built at low cost within African communities by the people who make things already in these spaces and which can serve as a kind of what we call scaffolding um, or essentially a toolbox uh, which young makers or an emerging generation of makers can gain access to tools and technologies to allow them to also engage in sort of innovation practices. And the, the project has three components, one being the sort of deployable makerspace kiosk, um, and then toolkits which uh, sort of young makers can, can customize based on what they want to make, as well as a, an app which can facilitate sort of sharing of information and trading as well between makers. Um, I think I will, since you guys can see my screen, I will maybe just click through here. Um, some of the images of the young people working on the app, testing it. And we developed this within uh, a scrapyard in this in the city of Accra called Agobloshi. This is the first um, two modules of the prototype makerspace. Um, some of the sort of development processes, working with people from the community as well as young uh, students and recent graduates in STEAM fields, so science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, to build this sort of low cost uh, structural frame, which can be built um, using uh, offcuts from the construction industry. So the, um, the trusses themselves have very short uh, elements in the webbing, and that's what you can use the steel reinforcement that you see in concrete buildings. Um, similarly, the development of the, of the toolboxes uh, working with members of these communities. Um, and here you can see uh, some of the toolboxes. Uh, and I think maybe I can, I can sort of close with this aspect of talking about. So here is the sort of overall um, uh, I hope I'm not, am I frozen? Okay, no, I'm not frozen. My computer maybe is frozen, um, but this is a design which has a kit of parts. So there's a structural element and uh, here you can see, so these are the structural elements, which I said, which can be prefabricated and then just bolt together. We actually use bolts that are recovered from uh, old automotive scrap, um, because again, we're interested in trying to recover materials from uh, the waste industry. Okay, sorry, I unfroze myself. 
maybe maybe uh, I will I won't try and, and show all those images. I could potentially show them um, again afterwards, but to try and sort of bring it um, in a way back to where I started, um, the the makerspace project, which um, uh, we now uh, built five modules of. Um, uh, four were built in Ghana. One has actually been shipped now to uh, to Germany, where it's been used as a pop-up makerspace. Um, the other module was developed in Dakar in Senegal, and has also been deployed to uh, Mauritania and then traveled back to to Senegal. So this is an open source project um, which we've been developing and sharing as a as a platform to allow young makers um across africa and the diaspora um sort of you know across the atlantic sphere in the world to be able to engage in sort of um helping to design and create their futures to participate in innovation and what i would love to see us all sort of challenge ourselves to think about as we continue to develop the air center as we continue to think about um new and innovative and creative ways that we can uh, shape um, the future of innovation for sort of all people on earth, um, I would encourage us to think about how can we do this in messier ways? How can we do this in ways which are less clean, which are less bounded, which are less, don't even necessarily have the same aspirations to perfection, which is sort of inherently exclusive and um, uh, exclusionary. And to say that you want to sort of create something that is pure, you're automatically trying to sort of eliminate other people. So how can we engage messiness and how can we be more willing and more open to rethink how we think about what is ours or what is our intellectual property or what do we own when we recognize that a lot of the institutions which house us today um, are directly and interdirectly and in many ways continue today to be beneficiaries of a system which was highly not just and which was very much horrific. Um, and we have to think about how we can center that in, in our models of innovation to dismantle that legacy and create more inclusive and equitable futures. Well, thank you, DK. It's a very, very impressive presentation. Very interesting experience. I was just thinking here, thinking here how we could maybe bring some of them to Brazil. <laughs> we have a lot of <laughs> social needs here. Uh, so we now will start a debate. Maybe I could uh, bring some questions together and and then you, you answer later. I, I would start using my my, my 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 space as moderator to have put one question for you. Uh, how, how do you, do you evaluate? In, in fact, it's two things. First, how do you see that the local knowledge uh, is used in these projects, uh, the, the local uh, experience, and also, if you see how you see if they they help to 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 strengthen the social organization in this mm -hmm. in these places but i also put here two questions that were made by, by our participants can i can i start with the first question philip okay you prefer like it okay is that okay just <laughs> my brain uh, because I think I think this question of local knowledge really um, strikes at the heart of, in, in a way, what I'm also trying to to get at, right? Which is that not only are there many local knowledges, and I think I remind, reminds me again of, of last year when we were in uh, in Nigeria for the Air Center meeting, and we did a tour of the fisheries and speaking with some of the folks who worked out there, and we talked about, you know, they've done many of these pilot projects and you know research initiatives over the years and I, I work a lot with the informal sector and with trying to sort of understand traditional knowledge um, and epistemologies and how do we relate that to a sort of scientific regime which oftentimes excludes that knowledge until we validate it or appropriate it in many ways and then claim 
claim that it's true because we've proven it. Um, but these people who took it as, as truth because it was proven within their societies in the past, it was not considered legitimate. So, but when in Nigeria, a lot of the, in the, at the fisheries, they also said that, you know, it's amazing how much knowledge um, local fishermen have in these communities that, you know, for generations you've been fishing in the same waters and you have all of this knowledge and it's kind of unbelievable. And oftentimes when you come as a scientist into this space to talk with these people, partly it's just becoming a translator of learning what these people know and then translating it into an essentially another language. But at the same time, there's also enormous knowledge which these fishermen simply do not understand. They cannot, I mean, obviously you can't relate that to, you know, what you can get through, through satellite technology and some of the models which exist and predictive capabilities or even just the ability to collect data over larger areas there is a level of, of sort of knowledge construction which is not um, accessible to people in these communities. So I think for me, the part of this um, aspiration maybe with the wildness idea or encouragement to be a little bit, um, I mean, wild has different meanings is to say that it's not just about sort of recognizing that there's local knowledge. It's also about trying to massively expand uh, or accelerate the the rate at which we can communicate between this local knowledge and a kind of global scientific community's body of knowledge right so that it's not just sort of at the at a very slow pace you have a unidirectional transfer of information but how can we have these information flows be much much more rapid and and at operating at much um much larger scales nice uh, we have a question here from Ana Maria Martins, who asked how long it took the, this project in Ghana, and if you have any feedback from the, the population. Sure. So, I mean, um, I guess I showed a couple projects in Ghana, but the, the main one I'm, I'm guessing is also this makerspace project that we've been working on. Um, and we have uh, enormous amounts of feedback from many different stakeholders, and that's why uh, Yasmin Abbas, the co-PI on the project and I are, are writing a book about it because we've written a number of papers, but the, the, the complexity is, is a little bit larger. So, I mean, in a nutshell, um, if I were to explain that project, I would say, um, sorry, the question was about the, about the- uh, How long it took the, the project? Yeah. And if you have any, any feedback from the-, the Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the long is, is easy enough. The feedback is what I was trying to explain because it's a little bit complicated. Um, I mean, we started the project uh, with a theoretical model in 2012. We spent 2013 uh, so essentially preparing the pilot project, which ran from 2014 to the end of 2017. Um, and then since then, we've been developing the subsequent versions and we're about to launch the latest blueprints for the version 5.0. Uh, of what we call the spacecraft, because it's a, a space for crafting, um, and we'll be we'll be launching that this summer. So it's it's been a number of years. Um, the project has evolved through a variety of iterations across that time, and we've gone through three uh, um, three to five, depending on how you model it, full sort of different iterations of the of the design for the spacecraft. I think the feedback from the community, first of all, there may, there are different communities. So like I said, we've worked with about uh, 2,000 young people now um, from West Africa, uh, Europe, and the United States on the project. Um, about half of them are uh, young makers from the informal sector, or what we call the grassroots. So oftentimes they didn't really go maybe even to high school. Um, sometimes they did, but typically they've gone through a kind of apprenticeship path or just sort of gone into survival mode. And we've actually worked with them as well as young um, students and recent graduates in science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics. So the feedback from these different groups are, are different and they're multiple, um, but generally speaking, they've been positive. I mean, part of it has to do with people gaining new perspective. And this goes back to seeing people in different ways. So typically within Ghana, which is a very class, class divided society and has a lot of ethnic and religious kind of uh, schisms, um, young people who are fortunate enough to go to college are uh, 
essentially more privileged and don't want to have anything to do with essentially young people who didn't go to college who are from a sort of lower class. And these classes don't really mix, um, and especially when it's sort of compounded by tribal boundaries. So by getting these young people to come together and to collaborate, um, it's very obvious and it's very simple, but it reminds you that these other people are also people. They're young people just like you. Um, they laugh, they have fun, and you are able to sort of expand people's otherwise circumscribed social networks. And some of those kinds of, um, uh, if not necessarily friendships, relationships have continued for a variety of different pathways. Um, and I think another aspect of it has been also about people oftentimes want to participate in something but don't know how. Um, and this is what we found is that oftentimes when you have a large problem, uh, people want to do something, but they don't really know how to engage. And so when you can give them a kind of open framework um, and a sort of open way to enter into a project and participate, then it becomes more accessible. So some, many of these people have been involved for anywhere from 30 minutes to a few hours to a few days to a few weeks to a few months to a couple of years. So there's a range of, of involvements. Um, and obviously the feedback you have from different people um, correlates with the, the nature of their participation. But I would say generally speaking, it's been important for people to challenge their views of the world um, and also to feel empowered to participate in something which is larger than themselves. Nice. We have a question here from Mitchell. He asks you, how are you planning, designing, engineering for clean water? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I guess I, so I can say, so speaking to our design in particular, so we have um, a very specific model, which is that we're developing a sort of uh, set of intercoordinated elements, which collectively work as a kind of kit of parts, which is what we call the AMP spacecraft or the aggregation matrix aggregation makerspace platform spacecraft. Um, and so part of that does in, involve uh, sort of soft infrastructure. Uh, essentially, it's a living wall system that can support uh, everywhere from hydroponics to aquaponics, um, you know, at the wall scale. It's sort of an eight foot by eight foot module, um, as well as um, supporting uh, basic, you know, serving as a basic bioreactor. Um, and so part of that also includes water filtration. Um, so that's a system that we're developing uh, with students here at Penn State University um, uh, through a course I teach open design and manufacturing and we did first cycle of that in the spring and this year we'll be doing um, a second cycle of that uh, and actually hope to open that up to really as many people who want to be involved. We're in conversation with a few folks right now in Ghana who would sort of participate as sort of parallel uh, research on that. So that's our approach to it. But I would also say, and I'm sure you know this, I mean, there's many, many examples of people who have worked with clean, clean water systems. But my issue is how much of that information is accessible to people in their village or in their neighborhood or in their community? It's not accessible. And, and that's our problem. And I think that's kind of what I'm getting at with this sort of wild innovation as well, which is that it's not just necessarily what we do, but it's where we put it and how we create pathways um, and, and portals to allow people to access that information and appropriate, uh, appropriate it, um, make it their own, but then also innovate on top of it. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Jerry Miller wants to participate and give some contribution here. Before I put the next question. Seems that my internet connection is unstable at the moment. You can, we can hear you well. Uh, I so I, I, I was going to ask uh, DK I, about his, his early comment that uh, I, we were thinking about coastal areas uh, uh, where people interact uh, in various ways very intimately with uh, the coastal ocean, lagoons, uh, et cetera. And this puts me in mind of, uh, of artisanal fisheries, for instance, and uh, the, the small industry infrastructure, et cetera, that, uh, that surrounds uh, coastal industries of that sort. Have, have you thought about uh, applying your concepts to uh, like in the factory setting, they, uh, you know, for instance, fish processing or, uh, or 
small boat uh, uh, design, production, and repair, things that engage directly with, um, uh, with the ocean, kind of looking seaward. And, and then I, I thinking also about looking a bit landward, I, uh, like across the lagoon to nearby areas on the, on the continent. I, you know, in other words, the entire coastal zone wet and, and dry. Uh, for uh, the things that support the livelihoods of, uh, of the large populations in, in such areas? Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's, a, it's a great question and a great point. And I mean, the short answer is, is no, we haven't deployed specifically in a kind of like uh, fisheries or sort of water uh, marine workers community, let me say that, um, because I mean, we've worked, we've, we've deployed in cities that are on the coast and actually Agrobolushi, which is the scrapyard where we have the, the two modules in Accra and then we have a, a third module now just next by, next to it. Um, it's actually that lagoon spills directly into the Gulf of Guinea. So it's actually essentially on the coast and within walking distance, probably like 15 minute walk, 20 minute walk is a fishing village like right on the beach. So I know that these communities are sort of within adjacency. Um, we'd love to work there. I mean, I would say that's that's a dream. I would say, I mean, to be able to engage with the air center community and network to to look at that. Um, we think that the the next release of the of the open source blueprint is going to be significant in that we've gone through quite a number of ways of optimizing cost and sort of letting this work appropriately as a kind of platform architecture that people people can build on. So I think we're almost at the point where we're ready to really, really do that. But this would be my dream because also I think all these coastal cities speaking to West Africa, which is more of my experience, but you can extrapolate other places, people are dying all the time in flooding. And it's kind of crazy because these are these are literally places which have long histories of communities living on water and where like people are making boats and swimming. And there's there's a sort of massive disconnect between a historical cultural way in which we engage water and a contemporary one where we sort of imagine it doesn't exist and put in some concrete sort of, you know, channels and say everything's gonna be okay. Um, so we, we need to absolutely um, think about uh, a massively scalable approach, which can actually touch the ground in every single community where people are living on the coast. Uh, well, following, we have some questions here. I'll put two together uh, from Yesin and from Bamol. They both are asking first, if you have any projects or application in the US, and also if you have any projects in French speaking countries like Senegal. Okay. Um, so, um, I mean, in terms of, uh, I mean, projects related to the AMP project in the US, um, not directly, although, like I said, here at, um, uh, here at Penn State, we're continuing to develop the project through uh, Penn State ISEDA, as well as my lab, Humat Lab, um, and sort of other partners around. So in that sense, it's, it's on the ground. We're building a module of the spacecraft here uh, at Penn State, because again, I didn't go that deep into the sort of technical dimensions of this, but essentially this is a sort of 10 foot cube, uh, which can all be networked together. So essentially you can have a massively distributed sort of workshop maker space um, across uh, non-co-located uh, geographies. So that's the idea is to sort of enable, you know, our students here at Penn State to collaborate alongside their peers in other parts of the world. So. Um, that's something that we're doing here in the United States at Penn State. And we also did um, a similar project at the University of Florida. Uh, this would have been maybe two years ago. Um, and that was, they actually, architecture students designed and built a makerspace in a scrapyard in the city of Gainesville um, using scrap uh, sourced from the scrapyard, including, ironically enough, some scrap that I believe came from their university when they demoed some buildings. And they used that to build a makerspace, which is now uh, actively operating um, in Gainesville. It didn't follow the design of the AMP spacecraft, but it sort of used the model. And we we just published that in a, in a uh, paper which came out, uh, I think, the last couple of weeks um, in the European Journal of Creative Practices in Cities and Landscapes or something. Yeah. Uh, great. We have a question here from Gordon. 
He says, great to hear my former office mates speak about this important topic. The water ar architecture project seem to focus on river communities. Are we developing system for coastal communities as well, where the architecture probably needs to be more robust against sea waves? Well, so, hi, Gordon. Yeah, it's my old office mate. Um, great question as always. I mean, so, um, I believe that there is some work being done on that. I mean, I think so, for example, in a, in a US context, there's enormous work being done about how do you hurricane proof uh, communities and things like this. But in terms of um, work that's happening, again, in the area that I was talking more about, which is the West African context, I think it's quite limited um, in terms of how people are approaching it. Because again, people tend to choose what they feel like are the biggest, most critical problems. And sometimes they, they sort of decide that the, the entry point into an urban scale problem in a city like Accra or Lagos is at the scale of urban infrastructure uh, or policy and governance, as opposed to at the scale of domestic dwellings or an architectural, te architectural technology, which can be scaled at the household scale. So I think there's a lot more work that can be done there. I think there's huge opportunities, absolutely. Um, and I showed Kunle's project because I think this is definitely part of the future, which is literally thinking about if you know that uh, water is rising and cities are gonna go underground, then why not think about how your buildings can float? There are a lot of other countries that do that, the Netherlands that does that. Um, so there's a history of that within architecture. There's a history of that even to a certain extent within some coastal communities in Africa. So um, that's one of the stronger models. Our project hasn't been specifically on, um, on floating, although like, you know, with the Anam project, it's about designing for life on land and water and making that recognition that that as humans we're kind of you know amphibious somehow um so i think there's a lot more work that can be done in that area absolutely uh great uh ne next question from jose monteiro he says very interesting presentation is it possible to relate knowledge craft witchcraft science, technology, and the global history of innovation? Yes. So uh, I think you said witchcraft, right? So I'm going to go with it yes. because um, <laughs> if you've seen some of the projects in the past work, Yasmin and I, we also talked about Juju, uh, which as my father, uh, who is himself an eminent scientist, would often say is kind of African electronics. So um, I would say in a nutshell, uh, I think that there is... Um, there's huge opportunity to learn more. And maybe I'll just share an anecdote. So uh, years ago, I gave a talk at the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences in South Africa, which was set up and led by um, uh, a South African uh, uh, physicist who runs the, or I think, believe, I think he runs the Hemisphere Institute. And uh, I think his name is Turk, and Neil Turk. And he, we, we were talking one time and we were, we were on a bus to dinner and somebody made a comment about uh, juju or witchcraft and, uh, and everyone sort of laughed. And I was like, I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, you know, there's no difference between uh, juju and quantum mechanics. And everyone was like, oh, you're, la you're, you're an idiot. And then, and of course, uh, Neil said, actually, no, I agree. I think that you're right. There's a lot there. And then everyone sort of shut up because here's this sort of super eminent scientist saying he thinks that actually maybe there's a relationship between juju and, and quantum mechanics. So I say all that because, I mean, I think one thing, and this goes back to the beginning about messiness um, and sort of, and trying to make things be clean versus being multiple, is that the sort of Western, mo Western model of knowledge is that you sort of always know everything and you keep on knowing until you know everything. And in certain, not all, but in certain kind of African philosophical approaches, there's a recognition that there are natural systems, but then when something happens that cannot be explained, then you explain it through sort of what people frame as, as supernatural interactions. But now science is catching up with this kind of a logic and we understand that there are aspects to the science that we know, uh, which we don't know. And we call them, of course, things like dark matter and, and dark, en dark energy and things like this. So I think that there's definitely a relationship. I think that there's, a, there's deep knowledge that exists within um, certain veins of, of, uh, of, of, sort of traditional knowledge, uh, which can absolutely be continue to be sort of excavated. And as we understand it further, we will explain it possibly through a new language, but, but possibly come to similar conclusions. Definitely. Uh, well, we have one last question from Karen. 
how do the communities you are working with view this idea of wild innovation as their their ideas of sustainable in the long term? Mm -hmm. So, um, so one thing is, like, I guess today is, is I just sort of threw out this idea of wild innovation because it's we're writing a book. I've been sort of buried in texts on innovation and um, and sort of various different parameters, and so I wanted to take advantage of today to sort of throw this out there and 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 begin a conversation with with colleagues that we can continue. Um, so I don't necessarily go into communities trying to theorize the activities in which, which we're engaged. Um, people don't have time for that. But I will say I think there's one aspect which I find very often sort of in terms of informal innovation and how people work, which is I think super relevant to a broader cultural moment today, which is that people don't really necessarily care about the history of where things came from or all of its complexity. They're really interested in utility. Like how does this help me right now? And what can I use to do whatever? And I think this is also this idea of, of wildness, which is that we should not be afraid to just sort of throw things out there and let people use it. So I say that in the context of our work, there are a lot of things that we are doing which maybe are too academic for people on the ground and they are not necessarily as interested, but the things which are directly relevant and relate to their circumstances, they understand quite well and they're more than willing to appropriate and use them. And I think that's really the goal of innovation is helping it to spread. Um, and so I think in that sense, uh, people already naturally and intrinsically um, are very fluent and capable and just sort of grabbing things that offer utility and, and sort of starting to tinker with them and, and innovate on top of them. Nice. Uh, Greg, do you like to give some contribution for our discussion here? Yeah, um, DK, that was a really good presentation. And I just wanted to say that, you know, climate change is probably the greatest threat to the blue economy in the long run, because it's basically going to disrupt all coastal zones. And I was wondering if your floating design can inform coastal infrastructures, whether those are ports or fishing communities or aquaculture systems on how to prepare for a varying range of sea level rise, say between one and three meters. And we don't know how fast it could occur. It could be 50 years, 30 years, or 100 years. Do you think that this, this approach that you're taking could be implemented at a much grander scale? I think absolutely, and I think that it will. Because I mean, we're essentially faced with two, two or three strategies, all right? I mean, it's like, we know that with climate change and sort of like extreme weather events, storms, storm surges and, and rising sea levels that large, like I mean, lots of places where people live are gonna go underwater. So, but at the same time, people are not really interested in just sort of massively moving away from the ocean to like live in all the sort of like, like scientifically calculated safe spots because humans are, are greedy and whatever, we have our own reason. So, so essentially we're gonna be dealing with this issue continuously. And so you're, you're presented with the option of kind of continuously retreating from the ocean and constantly moving backwards um, and sort of abandoning your infrastructure into the sort of ocean ecosystems or to shift your attitudes and to say, well, we don't necessarily just live on land, we live on land and water. And that was sort of my sort of premise with the idea of blue green infrastructure is that it doesn't make sense to keep retreating for the rest of humanity's existence on this earth when we more than easily enough can develop and advance the technology, a lot of it already exists, to, to live on water and on land and sort of move between these zones. And I think also that when we talk about the blue economy, I think it's still like literally wide open. We don't know necessarily what that means, but in my view, I think it also means that many, many more people will engage with the ocean on a daily basis as part of their life. I think that there'll be many more livelihoods that engage the ocean and there'll be a lot more mobility that engages the ocean, human mobility. Um, and so I think that, yeah, I mean, who designs those systems? Um, obviously I'm arguing that we, we also develop systems that people can build themselves in their own communities, um, as opposed to another form of imported technology. Thanks. Nice. We have a new question from Paul. He says, thanks for the really exciting presentation, DK. The idea of natural infrastructure is very timely. Friedrich Handert Wasser, the Vienna artist, 
an architect pioneered ecological architecture and infrastructure. Does that have a role in wild innovation? Mm. Mm. So um, I think this particular architect, I have to look uh, up to look at their name. I'm not sure if I'm familiar with their work, but I mean, I knew I know the idea, the sort of broader field of um, ecological design. Um, there's also now a kind of conversation on ecological urbanism. So I would say it, it absolutely does. Um, and like I said, I mean, there's all kinds of innovations now. I mean, I'm, there's I books are free innovation, uh, open innovation. I mean, everyone's trying to figure out what these, these models of innovation might mean. And I think all I was throwing out with the wild was also just to say, if, um, if uh, Hirata talks about wild architecture, why can't we think about innovation in a sort of more expansive way? and in one which is much more or much more open-ended. But I think definitely ecological design, ecological architecture, um, it plays a role. I think for me that the problem is once you start to label something as ecolog ecological architecture, you're already bounding it again. You're already sort of saying that it's just sort of just the design of this building. And we know that the future is much more interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary and that our cities are not just buildings. Um, they're not just hard infrastructure. Um, and so maybe it can be productive and useful and we can make things a bit more wild if we sort of look at things in a more sort of global and macro perspective, as opposed to sort of saying ecological building or ecological architecture. And that's why I think the Air Center is particularly interesting because we're saying, let's really look at the Atlantic Ocean and all of these, all of these, these environments as, as a laboratory um, with millions and millions of people living in it. It's super, super timely and relevant. Okay. Jerry, do you want to make one last contribution for, for us? Yes, thank you. Um, I, just returning to the, um, to the concept of, um, uh, of traditional knowledge and how it plays into the present day approaches to, um, to design, building, uh, and, and our sciences. Um, I, it, it seems to me that um, we might think of traditional knowledge as knowledge which has been gained over a long period of time. It's kind of the temporally integrated wisdom that comes from uh, individuals and communities uh, living close to their landscape uh, for, for generations upon generation. Uh, so we have that. It's, uh, it, it, properly used, it can be very, very valuable in the, in the current context. On the other end of the spectrum, I, at DK, you mentioned that we have satellite imagery, we have uh, numerical models, you know, the, all of the modern whiz-bang things that, uh, that we can use. So finding the, the most productive joining or, uh, or overlapping of those two I think um, uh, I think there's lots of value to be found in in that mm -hmm. uh, overlap. Um, the concept of um, of ecological design, ecological ar architecture, I think falls in that space um, I, as well. Uh, and it was not only Friedrich Hundertwasser, but uh, but many many others over the last um, century or so have touched on this in in various mm -hmm. ways. But I think now now we have the ability to approach such things with, with more rigor, more, uh, uh, more in-depth uh, analyses and, and approaches. And I think what you're doing, DK, sort of falls in, in that realm. So uh, you know, thanks again for bringing this uh, discussion to us uh, uh, today, and I look forward to, um, to future dialogue. Thanks. Yeah, definitely, that's great. Well. I think it was a great discussion. Uh, I think we are facing a great challenge, all this pandemic uh, context. And, but maybe it's opportunity to, to rethink some things, rethink some parameters and rethink the, 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 the way we develop our solutions, the way we relate with the, the workers, with the traditional population, with, all these people. So I think it was great to hear from DK. Thank you, DK, for all the, the presentation, the experience. Thank you, Jerry Miller and Greg Jenkins for the participation, the contributions. And I would like to thank Air Center and Jose Moutinho and all this for the 
proposal of this panel and and to promote this exchange between us. Uh, there was a, one person, Pedro Tojo, that asked the presentation. Not, I don't know if it's possible to send by email. Okay. Okay. And I'd like to thank all the participants to, who give great questions to, to our discussion and hope we'll have other, other discussions, other exchanges like this. Well, Thanks. I think that's it. Thank you. Hope to great. see you next time. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Bye.